Hello, this is Angelica Yingst, and you're listening to Centered, grounded conversations about the metaphysical. Blessed December, it is I, Angelica, of the Fortress of Comfy Blankets and Cheesy Hallmark Movies. I come bearing news of the stars, the earth, and the tarot. I honestly haven't been sleeping properly, so that means I've been napping all day, which is a nice change of pace to not sleeping and not napping. But honestly, this is my time of year, and that's kind of my speed sometimes. I need to catch up on all the sleep that I'm missing. I love winter. I love December. It moves us into that winter season, but we're already starting to feel it. Granted, I'm, you know, I'm a hot flash and mama, so I step outside and I feel totally normal at 28 degrees. But we are looking at December's astrology, which has retrogrades, directs, action, adventure, momentum for 2024. And doesn't that sound great? Of course it does. Because we start December, like every December, in the optimistic and enthusiastic energy of Sagittarius, which honestly encourages us to see the best in the future. It is a wonderful way to set lofty goals for yourself. And as we enter Capricorn season at the end of the month, we're going to open the path up to really be able to bring those ambitions into reality and pave the way for a thriving 2024 Because Capricorn is an earthy leader and doer. And so it opens the way. Even if it's not evident at the beginning of the month, we're talking about Capricorn as that cardinal earth sign. So it does, you know, it's really earth. Earthiness does things, you know, it kind of is, it needs things to be tangible. So I'm counting on this, y'all. I'm just saying, I'm just counting on this one. But during Sagittarius season, of course, We're going to enjoy some of the energy of Sag, which is to embrace compassion and generosity and joy. There's a boundless energy that serves as a reminder that incredible things can happen when you believe in yourself and you strive, strive for more, strive for whatever it is that you want, your goals. Yet it can also be challenging to set boundaries and exercise restraint when we're in Sag. However, we're going to start the month with Mercury moving into Capricorn on December 1st. And that brings stability to our thoughts. It's a time to kind of blend optimism with an open heart. Now, on December 4th, Venus makes its way into Scorpio, and that really adds a kind of intensity to your romantic experiences. When Venus kind of slides into the moody waters of Scorpio, shit gets real. And Venus, the planet of love, money, attraction, takes its job seriously in Scorpio. So it's time to fully understand what you want in life and what you want in your relationship. So check those relationship deal breakers before you're in a relationship, okay? Because when you're in the relationship and you are not thinking rationally because you don't think rationally with all those, you know, serotonin, uh, love energies and hormones going through your brain, it's really important to say, you know, I need to make sure that my deal breakers will actually cut the deal, you know, because if you're in the mood to settle down, this is a great kind of connection for that. It's a great transit for that. But if you're kind of being wishy-washy with boundaries, being wishy-washy with all that kind of stuff, Um, I would say boundaries, red flags, you know, what happens in relationships, this could turn into a blood sport, y'all. So jealousies really can happen. Um, So, you know, one Angie side note, I've been holding women's circles for like a decade now. And when I talk with women, I consistently hear, jealousy and insecurity come out in ways that get validated by others. So I think that one of the things that we can do is deal with our jealousy without saying it's the other person, you know, and I think that's where this Venus and Scorpio can add that intensity. It can be exciting or it can be, you know, heartbreaking or um, just maddening to be kind of stuck in that loop. 
I was in a women's circle where people were debating um, pornography um, and whether if your partner looks at pornography, is that cheating? And I was so sad about this. I, you know, everybody kind of validating each other that, you know, when our partners are allowed their sexuality, they are cheating on us. You know, they're, they're betraying us in some way. You are allowed autonomy within your own sexuality. And this is just the kind of transit that can make us feel possessive and jealous and um, can really inhibit intimacy and passion because we're not allowing autonomy in the other person, okay? I'm not saying, I'm not talking about someone who's addicted to pornography or if that's even a thing, but, you know, who's addicted to whatever, sex. Um, I'm talking about within normal realms of, like, having and possessing your own sexuality, okay? This is important, you know, as we kind of look at these transits, like, how does that come up? You know, I might just say, and blow it off. Like I was going to, you know, December, Venus makes its way into Scorpio. It's going to be a little intense. What I mean by that is shit gets real, right? The shit gets real by you have to be discerning in the battles you fight. And you can build intimacy by saying, I feel threatened when I know you've looked at pornography. Why? You know, what, what makes me feel threatened? And get, do that like internal work before we start like telling our partner that, you know, their normal human sexuality, you know, is something that's a red flag. Okay. And that's all I'm saying. And yeah, I'm talking about masturbation. Okay. Humans masturbate for many reasons and not all of them are pathological or sinister or anti-woman, you know, or anti-men, you know. And I'm just feeling called to talk about this because I feel like when I look at these transits sometimes, I'm like, oh, yeah, you know, this is going to be one of those times where someone's going to feel cheated upon um, by someone just doing something normal. So just pay attention to that. You know, you can build a deeper intimacy by having conversations without yelling, you know, without accusing, without, you know, kind of jumping into someone else's personal sexuality. So, you know, obviously, if anything I'm talking about interferes with intimacy, that's different. That's where you set the boundary and set, you know, the line. But the Scorpio and Venus thing can be a shit show if you don't have a clear understanding of who you are and what you want. So if past relationships have left you with emotional scars, this energy can guide you to looking at that and creating healthier connections, okay? So we're starting December with that kind of in, in the air. Now, on December 6th, Neptune goes direct in Pisces, and that kind of shakes up the snow globe of your life. I'm trying to use December metaphors, but the planet Neptune, it's an interesting planet. It's watery, obviously, but it has been kind of playing mind games with us because it is it has been retrograde for the past five months. So it's been trying to shake you up, okay? Um, and so Neptune getting back on track, you'll start to see what all the stuff that you worked with in Neptune was really all about, okay? So Neptune retrograde in Pisces has really kind of fucked with a lot of our heads. So there I said it. But um, we're going to kind of get back on track, okay, and um, feel like, oh, wow, I was wandering in a fog, and now I can see that it's clear out, you know. Um, I hope that made sense. Okay, on December 12th, it's our new moon, and that pops up in Sagittarius. So it's basically your cosmic wish-granting moment, and Sag new moons are really fun. This is a great time to start thinking about your intentions for the new year and maybe the stuff you're ready to release. Um, and then, you know, as we're kind of having this last hurrah uh, at the new moon, the next day, Mercury goes retrograde until January 1st. So let's talk a little bit about Mercury retrograde, shall we? Because I know people get 
freaked out about Mercury retrograde, but is it time to freak out or is it time to freak in? All right, I don't even know what that means, but um, let's talk about what Mercury retrograde is. All retrogrades are basically giant planetary optical illusions. All planets revolve around the sun, but there are times when it appears from the earth, and that's where astrology is based from. It's always based from the earth. Um, so it appears from the earth, because we're on earth, um, that our motion around the sun, that a planet will stop and go backwards and then stop again and move forward or go direct. So this isn't happening at all. It's just an optical illusion, this physics. It's kind of like when you're at a stoplight and you're rolling forward very slowly and the car next to you is moving more slowly than even you. So it looks like they're moving backwards when actually you're overtaking them. Okay, so we're actually overtaking Mercury on the orbital highway, so to speak. So this is why Mercury seems to move backwards. And any retrograde, that's what it is. Because from Earth, we perceive this as a retrograde. And astrologers believe it affects us as Earthlings. By the way, this happens to all planets from our point of view on planet Earth. Mercury is perhaps the most well-known retrograde because it happens three times a year. And Mercury is closest to the sun. So Mercury is the messenger god in ancient Greek mythology. So this planet rules communication, electronics, telephones, in-person communication, and affects electronics. So when computers go on the fritz, when phones drop in the toilet, that's kind of Mercury retrograde stuff. Um, so with, with all things, you know, in the sky, on Earth, this might be the energetic gift you need that you don't necessarily see. It, it forces us to pause. So Mercury retrograde gives us the gift of the sacred pause and taking a moment to breathe before talking, maybe replying gently, maybe putting things off for a couple of weeks. Since three weeks of Mercury retrograde is like long, but not too long, it often will give us a moment to just postpone things like signing contracts or communicating or making big decisions. It's time to slow down. It's time to do your homework. It's time uh, to kind of practice that idiom, measure twice, cut once. So Mercury retrograde tells us to keep measuring and then measure again and then measure again. We don't make decisions impulsively when Mercury is in retrograde. We plot along um, and it is a time of wonderful reflection and self-care. So I would avoid making like big plans during this period. It's not that they won't happen, but it's often that stuff comes up. Like we plan and God laughs happens more often in Mercury retrograde than any time else. But also, you know, if you do things, just know, okay, I might have a little issue. Does that mean it's not going to happen? No, it might happen. But just adapt, you know, um, use it as a time of introspection rather than a time of like isolating um, just embrace solitude instead of like going forward with stuff that you might already be on the fence with. If, if you feel impulsive about it during Mercury retrograde, wait. Okay. But I think vilifying Mercury retrograde probably isn't helpful since it happens so often. So, you know, that's all. That was my whole point of that. Um, so let, let's get back to our regularly scheduled woo woo festivities. Um, so as we move into Capricorn season with winter solstice on the 21st of December, you, you should feel a little more grounded and purposeful and all of that stuff. Um, if life feels like it's been too chaotic or moving too fast, this is a shift that might help you regain focus. So you can get ready for some really practical, purposeful guides in Capricorn. Um, I said guides. I meant vibes, but guides works too. It's like shifting from party mode to work mode, which isn't necessarily a bad thing. It's just, it's different. And so you're moving from Sagittarius to more party mode to work mode in Capricorn. But it's kind of poetic that we started our year and ending our year with a retrograde, Mercury retrograde in Capricorn. So on December 22nd, Mercury retrograde takes a little detour into Sagittarius, which can actually give us a little boost of energy, um, a chance to like dream and create and kind of have that creative fiery energy there. 
Um, so you can recalibrate on the 22nd if you're feeling a little out of sorts. And then we kind of close the year with a full moon in Cancer on the 26th of December. And this lunar event is backed up by Jupiter, prosperity, and then Saturn, productivity. So it's kind of a magical moment to kind of tap into right before uh, 2024. So now until the end of the year, your emotions should be probably softening and you're kind of getting in touch with some power. Now, Chiron goes direct on the same day, the 26th. So you might finally feel that forgiveness, that um, woundedness kind of coming full circle. And it could be a really cozy night because of that. So if I were you, which I'm not, get ready to gather your loved ones and just like have a really laid back day or evening. Um, and, you know, emotions might be running high. Communications might be difficult. So, you know, think about this time as being one where you start to have that forgiveness coming in. I have to say every full moon, my daughter and my mother both tell me how they can't sleep. And then I say, it's the full moon. And they completely ignore my wise comment. So here's what I'll say to anyone who listens. Full moons are activating. If you're sensitive to energy, and we are all highly sensitive people in my family, uh, you will feel the pull of the new full moon. You might just lie there with your brain racing, eyes open, thinking, why can't I sleep? I'm so tired. I keep thinking about things I want to do, changes I might have um, I might implement um, things I might say, conversations I should have had, because full moons really pull our eyes open and say, do it, go do it right now. So it's time to have that baby. You can think of the full moon as the pregnant be belly ready to birth things. And you know, when you're in labor, you can fall asleep in little bitty moments, but it's difficult to sleep. So the best thing you can do during that time is listen. What is your brain trying to say? What is your higher self trying to say? Go journal. Go do a massive brain dump. Write it out. Try to ignore it and it will keep you awake. Okay. So being sleepless on the full moon, you have to get that shit out. You have to write it out. You have to do something. Meditate, journey, journal, make art. Don't lie there counting down the hours. Use those hours. Be tired because you followed the moon's order to create and birth something rather than because you just laid in bed all night. So there, I said it. Thank you for coming to my TED Talk. All right, back to the astrology. Now, uh, December 20, 29th is when Venus saunters into Sag. So it you know, spends most of the month in Scorpio, then it moved to Sag, and that's when love and prosperity are kind of coming in. So that is really a great time to feel that, romantic energy so you move from serious let's deal with our shadow shit scorpio into sad which is ex exploring um ex yeah explorations of the heart figuring out like what where you want to go what you want to do traveling learning you know it's fun it's like finding treasure right um so uh, on the 30th of December, Jupiter goes direct in Taurus after four months of retrograde. And that's just a wonderful uh, transit because it kind of brings that luck and the wind at your back. So it shakes things up in positive ways. Um, so, you know, if you can start working on the resolutions before the Sag new moon on the 12th or whatever intention setting for the new year, you're going to look at this day as like, oh, okay, now I'm going to revisit this and really like go full out. What is my luck, right? So Mercury um, kind of goes direct on January 1st. So it's not, of course, in December, but it is pretty much the end of December. So that feels pretty good. So our major astrological events are Venus and Scorpio on the 4th. The 6th, Neptune is direct in Pisces. The 12th, the new moon in Sag. The 13th, Mercury retrograding Capricorn. And the 21st, Capricorn season begins. The 26th is the full moon in Cancer. The And Chiron goes direct in Aries. And the 29th, Venus enters Sag. And on the 30th, Jupiter goes direct in Taurus. So we have a lot more directs happening than retrogrades. 
but we have that one big retrograde. So let's talk about our tarot medicine for the month. You know, I just kind of shuffle the deck and pull a card out. And a few days ago, I was sitting at my desk and I thought, I'll just pull the medicine quick before I run my errands. And, you know, that was rushed. I didn't really do all the things that I normally do. Um, I pulled the tarot card and I grabbed an animal deck and blah, blah, blah. All that to say is none of it felt right. So this, you know, when I began to do the usual prep and meditation, um, I anointed and prayed and sang and did all the stuff. Um, I pulled the same card I pulled that first day, which was the Hierophant. So we're going to be working with the Hierophant or the Hierophant. Um, the rest of the medicine was different, but, um, you know, this medicine came up. Um, I feel like we worked with Hierophant before, but I can't tell you when. I think it was 2021. So when we look at the Hierophant, I don't even know what to say about such a vilified card. And why is it vilified, you ask? Well, in most circles, the Hierophant is represented by and called the Pope. So it kind of brings all the baggage any of us have that have ever dealt with the Catholic Church or read about the Catholic Church or understand the history of the Catholic Church. But the Hierophant was specifically not the Pope in the Rider Waite Smith deck. And I teach it like all other tarot teachers teach it, that it's the Pope. But, you know, I think it's important to talk about why it was different and how it was different. So when we go back to the earliest representations of the Hierophant tarot, they actually do call him the Pope. And it's really interesting how it evolved over time. So the very first tarot decks that are that we still have today that we can reference, like the Visconti Fuorza, took its inspiration from real life figures of the era. So Pope Felix V, who happens to be the last of what they call the anti popes, is represented by the Hierophant in the first Pope card we have. The anti popes were individuals trying to change the authority of the officially elected Pope. And they were kind of rebellious figures. And then, you know, and incidentally, the high priestess is called the Papess because there was this fringe movement in the 13th, 14th century in Catholicism that were fighting to have women go into the priesthood. And conversely, having a female pope seemed important. And it became a kind of a joke, the Papess, the female pope. Well, what will she do, you know? So it's worth noting that... Um, in many areas where the games were played with those original tarot cards, no, they weren't necessarily used for divination. They were used for games. And some people still play those games today. So um, the Catholic imagery may or may not have been desirable based on where you were uh, geographically. So there's some Catholic communities that saw it as sacrilegious. There are others that um, wanted them replaced. So, the German-speaking Protestant areas that had the tarot decks used Jupiter, the highest-ranking German god, so to speak, as a replacement of the Pope. Um, whereas in Belgium and northern France, Bacchus, the god of wine, was used as their substitution for the Pope. Um, so you have these kind of interchanges. Um, so... We don't really get the pure divination decks until the 18th century. And that comes from this guy named Etiel, Etiel, um, E-T-T-E-I-L-L-A. -E it's a pseudonym of Jean-Baptiste Alliet. And he, he, was, he lived between 1738 and 1791, and he was a French occultist and tarot researcher who first developed this uh, interpretation concept of the tarot cards. And so he made a really significant contribution to the development of the tarot cards to a wider audience, okay? Um, and so he's basically um, worked with uh, Marie-Anne Lenormand, and they made a deck together called the Lenormand deck. Um, so uh, et télé, Tiel, <laughs> uh, how you pronounce French, I don't know. Um, he published his ideas between correspondences between tarot astrology and the four classical elements and the four humors. And so he had a really significant understanding on, on the tarot. 
Then comes uh, Elif Eliphas Levi Zahed, who was born Alphonse Louise Constant in the early part of the 18th century, or sorry, 19th century. Um, he shows up about 40 years after Etiel dies. Okay. So Levi was a French esoterist poet and writer, and he pursued an ecclesiastical career in the Catholic Church. So he abandoned the priesthood right before he became ordained. And then he became a ceremonial magician. And the thing is, he never stopped wearing his hassock. He always wore the robes um, like a bunk. Um, but at 40, he began kind of professing knowledge of the es esoteric and occult. So he very much hit the scene during spiritualism's rise in England and the U.S., and he existed at the same time as the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn. So that's the magical society that Waite belonged to. And so one of his contributions was incorporating the tarot cards into a magical system. And as a result, many Western magicians use tarot as an important part of their practice. And that, that you can thank Levi for. Um, so he had a really deep impact on the magic of the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn. And later on to like Aleister Crowley, for example. Um, but Levi was the first one to kind of declare that a pentagram or five-pointed star with one point up and two down represent good. Levi's ideas influenced Helen Blavatsky and the Theosophical Society, which are very interesting. Um, Levi was the first person to associate the Pope, or, you know, the card, the Pope, with the Hebrew letter He, which is the breath that animates life. So although this card uh, had the word Le Pape, Levi renamed the card the Hierophant. And the reason he did that was it was from a Greek word translating to one who shows that which is holy. Um, and also, you know, he wanted to remove any explicit references to Christianity. And that is how that title began. Um, so we're looking at the, you know, 1800s for that to begin. So Levi brought a whole other level of symbolism um, from the pillared throne, which takes on the pillars of uh, Hermes and Solomon. Um, he used a lot of symbols all over, you know, to kind of show you like, okay, this and this and this. So why did it change? Well, you probably know why, because the Pope, quote unquote, the Pope as a card had a lot of baggage. There was a time when um, you could buy your way into heaven if you gave enough money to the Catholic Church. And so that was why um, the Pope was considered a corrupt figure. Um, they were supposed to be celibate. Many had children. I know we have two popes in our lineage, which is kind of funny in my family. Um, he can be considered controlling people, particularly from outside of the Catholic Church. So you can insider, insert whatever you want about Catholicism here, but the truth is that there was just a lot of baggage. And even today, with his new name, people still dislike him intensely because of their own baggage with the church. So why use this strange Greek-inspired word? Um I mean, first of all, it translates to one who shows the sacred or um, one who causes it to be seen or one who has visions. But the Hierophant was also in a specific role. And if you were studying esoteric knowledge, you would have studied the Greeks. And so you would know that the Hierophant was the one in ancient Greece who led the Eleusinian mysteries. These were the mysteries around Persephone and Demeter. So Eleusis is where Demeter hid, um, when she was letting the whole world starve to death. Um, and she was disguised as a crone. So I've told this story many, many times on this um, podcast. So it might be repetitive. I'm going to try to do it very briefly. So Persephone, the daughter of Demeter, is called Kore. So Kore is, that just means maiden. So before her kidnapping, her mother was very overly protective. Um, so she is out picking flowers. She's protected by sea nymphs. She's always protected by the nymphs. But um, Zeus promises Kore. So Zeus is the 
king of the gods, basically. He is the brother to Hades, which is, you know, the king of the underworld, the god of the underworld. Um, Zeus is also married to Hera, but she, but he is a man whore and he sleeps with everybody. So he um, is with Demeter. Okay, so Kore is their child. All right. So he promises Kore to Hades, his brother, as a bride. Doesn't tell Demeter. Demeter was a life-living goddess of agriculture, green, and the harvest, and she provided the mortals with food, vegetable, um, meat. She also gave them the ability to cultivate wheat, and she showed them how to plant seeds, nurture them, harvest them. She even taught them how to grind the grain to produce flour, which they could turn into bread. So when Cora is off, uh, Zeus asks Gaia to plant a Narcissa to lure her away. And when she does, Hades opens up the earth, snatches her, and swallows her back up into the earth. And so Demeter, when she can't find her daughter, loses her ever love and mind, as you do when your child's abducted and no one tells you shit. So she roamed the earth for days. And it sounds like Kore was quite young. Um, but she roams the earth for days and days on end driven mad by her own grief and anger, her beloved daughter's disappearance. This is all she can think about. So she searches endlessly, neglecting her duties to the earth. So she's not nourishing the mortals. The plants die. Uh, you know, they wither. The animals die. Famine ra ravages the earth. Um, and she's just like, I'm done. I'm done. I'm out, assholes, you know. And then she stops the harvest and she calls up her homegirls, pestilence and famine, the two goddesses, and says, you take care of the world right now. I'm over the shit. So one thing about the gods is that um, they are totally into what they're into. So they need their sacrifices. And if they don't come, they get testy, you know, so they need to be worshipped. So the cries of the mortals kind of reach Mount Olympus. Zeus is like, we haven't had any sacrifices in a while because the humans can't sacrifice stuff they don't have so zeus knows it's time to intervene to calm demeter and her wrath and just to like spare you the nitty-gritty details but to just cover this part when demeter's off mourning she disguises herself as a human as a crone meaning an old woman and she's sitting and this family comes upon her and takes her in invites her in they wash her um and they have uh, a baby, a young boy, and they ask her to take care of the young boy. And that child brings a lot of joy to Demeter. And she slowly comes back to herself. And each night, she loves this child so much that she takes him and dips him into the fire to make him immortal. Now, there were all kinds of these kind of stories of, you know, gods and goddesses that try to make humans mortal and one night, his aunt, the child's aunt, comes in and sees Demeter doing this. And she loses her ever love and mind. And Demeter has to stop and then reveals herself to be the goddess and says, you're stupid for stopping me. I could have made this child immortal. The kid is not immortal now. But anyway, um, she shows herself to be the goddess. And they knew, like, the mom was like, I thought you were a goddess. Um, but anyway... Uh, then Demeter asks them to build a temple right there, and that place is called um, Eleus Eleusis. So one of the things about Eleusis is that she just hides there for a while. And just to wrap up the Cori information, when she goes into the underworld, she marries Hades, and then she's referred to as Persephone. So she is now the queen of the underworld. Zeus eventually sends Hermes to the underworld to bring Persephone back, and... When he got there, he was kind of surprised because instead of this grief-stricken maiden who was being mistreated, she was a radiant queen. She fell in love with Hades. So Hades had made her beautiful gardens. He treated her with respect and compassion. And eventually she fell in love with him. So she it's not that she didn't want to see her mother. It's just she didn't you know, she was happy being married to him. So one thing he does thinking if, if this woman has a choice between her mother and me, she's going to choose her mother. So he feeds her six pomegranate seeds. So it was this belief that if you ate food given by someone, they would 
always um, be loyal to the person they gave food to. This was like a part of like a very complex idea of the stranger and hospitality. There are all these hospitality kind of rules. And um, so you see that in the Bible as well a lot that, you know, like the story of Sodom and Gomorrah is not about homosexuality, uh, even though it's been used that way. It was initially like really a story about hospitality and what we do to the stranger because the angels come to Sodom um, asking for a place to stay. And instead they take them off and, and rape them. But the idea, or they want to, that's what they want to do. Um, so, you know, it's like you didn't welcome me. You treated me as um, like something that you could just take. And so that's why God raised Sodom and Gomorrah. It was not because of the homosexuality. It was about, you know, not welcoming them in and treating them as family. So um, when Demeter and Persephone get together, basically um, Zeus is like, you have to split your time, Persephone, between your mother and, the, and, the, and your husband. So the six pomegranate seeds means that Persephone would spend half the year with her mother in Olympus and the other half with Hades. Now, Kore, before she becomes Persephone, is one of the harvest goddesses as well. So this is the description of how spring, fall, winter happens. So in autumn, Demeter begins her descent and Persephone uh, or sorry, Persephone begins her descent and Demeter begins her time of grieving, okay? So the Eleusinian mysteries then are, are kind of the most famous of the secret religious rites in ancient Greece. And according to the hymn of Demeter, the mysteries of um, Eleus Eleusis originates in a twofold story of Demeter's life, her separation from and reunion with her daughter and her failure to make the queen's son immortal. So after um, Eleusis was incorporated, the city of Athens took responsibility for the festival, but it always was held in Eleusis. So the mysteries begin with a march or a solemn procession from Athens to Eleusis. The rites were then performed in the Telesturion or the Hall of Initiation, where everything remained secret. Nothing was written down. Um, something was recited, we know. Something was revealed, we know. Acts were performed, but there's no sure evidence of what those rites were. Um, and some information that was not very reliable, Christian writers who tried to condemn the mystery as pagan abominations tried to say what happened. So do we believe them? I don't know. You know, generally, um, it, you know, it was said to include a, a ritual bath in the sea, um, three days of fasting, and then the completion of a still mysterious central rite. And these acts completed an initiation, and the initiate was promised benefits of some kind in the afterlife. Um, and so we believe even that this uh, religious practice is even older than what we would call like the ancient Greek time. It was uh, practiced during the My Mycenaean period. Um, so, again, there's like three phases, the descent, the search, and the ascent. And the main theme of the ascent being like a rebirth, okay? So, a lot of people believe that there was some kind of hallucinogenic drugs happening. Um, but at, in the end, um, the rites and ceremonies and beliefs were secret and consistently preserved. So, um, the longevity of the Eleusinian mysteries a consistent set of rites and ceremonies and experiences spanned almost two millennia. And so when we are talking about the Hierophant, what we're talking about is the leader of the mysteries, the one that understands and keeps the secrets of the way of the mysteries, and of course, the secrets and mysteries of the way of life, birth, and death. Okay, so that's where the Hierophant comes from. Now, when we look at the Hierophant, we do see a lot of Christian imagery because even though the name was changed, the imagery wasn't changed as much, but, you know, what they're representing are similar things, right? Which is, I hold this secret knowledge, this esoteric knowledge that I only pass on to my acolytes. So you see the Hierophant there, he's wearing red robes, he has this crown on, 
This is the papal crown. It's three-tiered, representing the Trinity. Um, and now we think of the Trinity in Christianity as the Father, Son, the Holy Spirit. In pagan uh, circles, that's the maiden mother crone. So really, you get to decide there. And then in front are two um, acolytes, so to speak. They both have the same hair, basically that shaven middle part, <laughs> shaven, you know, the monk the monk thing. Um, so, you know, he's wearing red and there's lots of gold. So there's obviously material stuff happening here. And I apologize for those who have misophonia, but I feel like my mouth is a little dry. So I'm really sorry. I keep trying to drink and pause and drink. Um, so I'm sorry if you're hearing mouth sounds, I'm trying not to, but at any rate, you know, he's wearing this gold and red, and we know that deals with money and the material. So there's like money in this job of channeling spirit, but don't get it crossed. He's definitely channeling spirit. And the Pope is, if you're not Catholic and don't understand who the Pope really is, he is the one that is the messenger of God. He talks to God, and then he passes that information on to everyone. Um, and then the priest, like, basically, the Pope passes it on to the cardinals, and then the cardinals to the bishops, and maybe I have that backwards, I don't remember which is higher, and then the priests, and, you know, and so it goes down to the individual person by this hierarchy, okay? And so when you look at these acolytes on the bottom, one's wearing a robe of roses, and the other wear is wearing a robe that has lilies on them. So they're said to like take two different paths. So you, you know, the idea here is that when we pass this information on, you do with that information different things depending on what your bent is, what your approach is. So, you know, the hierarchy is quite important in this idea, okay? There's this cross keys to the kingdom of heaven. And so one is the key of wisdom and, uh, and knowledge, and the other is the path of the heart. So it's the key of experience, like uh, devotional experience, like um, the mystical, okay? So we kind of see these two paths, and you get to decide which path you're going to take. So the Hierophant, even though he represents the keeper of secret knowledge, he is not, he is very much a spiritual figure. And I think we get that lost a lot in tarot explanations that just say he represents institutions, which he does. He represents learning, uh, universities, colleges. He represents the church. He represents the institution of marriage or the government or bureaucracies of any kind. Um, so he represents all that, but he is definitely teaching. He's definitely channeling information directly from the divine. And so there is a deep spirituality here with the Hierophant if you let there be. A lot of people are just like, oh, the Hierophant, that just means, you know, there's a bunch of bureaucracy. Maybe that could be part of it, but he represents the rules, okay? And I think one of the things that is interesting is how people react to the Hierophant. Because some people are like, I hate this. <laughs> I hate this card. It's all about rules and blah, 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 traditions. So whether you think of him as the Pope or you think of him as the Hierophant, the keeper of the Eleusinian Mysteries, you are keeping the same idea. He's passing this knowledge down to his disciples. He is inducing visions. He's passing on the traditions of benediction, because that's what his hand is doing. He's in a symbol of benediction or blessing, okay? So he's passing on the traditions of benediction, of ritual, of knowledge, and maybe that's the most important thing. He is passing on information. So it has to be very conforming. He never deviates from the rules or from the tradition of whatever he's doing. So he, you know, is passing on traditional information. And it can't waver. I worked for someone who taught me crystal healing. And she had a whole system for doing it. She had her whole method and it was trademarked. So when I was teaching there, even though my practice looked very different than her practice, like, you know, I wove in Reiki, I, ro I wove in shamanic healing, the stuff I did in my daily life because I have different training, not just hers. Um, when I was teaching there, I had to teach on the traditions. I could not say, well, I do it this way. 
you know, I mean, I could say as an aside, but generally what I was trying to do was pass on this tr tradition because how else will people know how to do what we do if you don't pass on exactly the way it's written, right? So that's part of what people rebel against with the Hierophant. He's so conforming. He's so traditional. He's such an establishment dude. He's the man. He's literally the man. So he is the teachings. And sometimes he's represented by, he represents a religion. Sometimes he just represents spirituality. Okay, like the tradition, things that are passed on. So that here, Hierophant teaches you about the religion and hopefully you get spirituality in there. Okay, that's what we're hoping. But, you know, the idea here is there's a difference between the religion and the spirituality. Okay, so he is a religious figure teaching you the traditions. Okay, so esoteric means knowledge that's, out, that's hidden. Okay, whereas esoteric is outside knowledge. He teaches both. Okay, so he is also teaching you about acceptable values, the outside self versus the hidden self. The, high, the Hierophant deals with, um, you know, the higher self as well, like tapping into who are you. So, you know, when somebody gets me a question about their marriage and they get the Hierophant, you know, it's not like I'm like, oh, there's really deep love. No, there's a tradition. You've stayed married. Maybe that tradition, wherever they got married in, or maybe it's just personal beliefs, they do not want to get divorced. They're staying married because they made a commitment, okay? That's following the rules, right? So it doesn't necessarily say anything about love. It just says, yes, they're staying married because they have a shared tradition they have a shared religion they have a shared idea that we are staying together no matter what it's tradition okay and so that's kind of that i think that's a good example is of how the hierophant really comes through okay because it comes through as the tradition all right sometimes you get this when you're thinking about or needing to go back to school or you need a teacher that has a hierarchical hierarchical way of passing knowledge down so for example if you're wanting to learn reiki you get the hierophant that's more of a reiki learning card than the hermit the hermit is about going one-on-one -on -one, seeking the teaching seeking the experience by being alone right even though we do search for a teacher in that way what we're really searching about is something individual now when he comes in reverse all rules are off he's not a rule follower. He's the opposite. He's rebellious. He is unconventional. He's bohemian. He is often going against the grain. So he has an unorthodoxy to him when he comes in reversed. And so when we talk about that, we are also talking about the fact that the Hierophant deals with your sense of right and wrong, your traditions. So, for example, I was not raised in a home where being gay was um, vilified at all. There was a lot of gay people in my mother's uh, circle, so we had a lot of gay couples coming up. So, it, you know, if I was gay, that would not come up through the Hierophant at all because it was not part of the rules. But if you were raised in a home where being gay was thought of as rebellious or bohemian or unorthodox or totally unacceptable you might get the hierophant reversed even if you have a traditional marriage it is based on the traditions of your background so generally you know we will see this in those kind of things but for example if i came home to my mother and said i was in a polyamorous relationship that might come in with a reverse hierophant because my mother would think that was Simperguenza or something like that. So, you know, uh, when you're reading for someone, it's really easy to project your ideas of shadow, what that would be. But it's really important to ask, you know, what, would, what were your rules? What were the rules in your house? Are you, uh, you're coming up as a reverse hierophant, which means you're a bohemian. You're not, you're living against the rules. You're living in opposition to the rules you were raised with. Now, a lot of people ask me like, oh, Angie, you know, the Hierophant is a five 
and that's about chaos. Why is the Pope coming in for chaos? And a lot of times the archetypes are either what happens, you know, with that numerology. There's some response to or vision of the world in that numerology. So when we have a five, you know, we know that chaos is coming, right? There's chaos here. And the way that they have made, you know, the Hierophant makes sense of chaos is through structure, rules, repetition. Institutions come up as a response to feeling chaos in the world. And, you know, that's why some people go to church when they're the, like everything hits the fan, right? Because they need something that they can count on. And that's why the Hierophant comes up as the five, because it is a response to feeling chaotic. I need structure. I need rules. I need an institution. I need, I need an answer for something. And you know that if you ask a priest, you will get an answer. Whether it's a good answer or a bad answer, it doesn't matter. There's an answer. You know, why did my child die? Because heaven needed another angel. Is that a great answer? No, but that's like the response of institution, right? It can sometimes just, well, that's, see, this is me projecting my own shadow onto it. But, you know, I think just remember that when you're working with the Hierophant, you have to figure out your idea of the rules. What were you raised with? And that can be a really great journaling idea is like, what were the rules I was raised with? What are the spiritual ideas? How does it work? And now who am I? Do I have an institution? What is the passing down of information that I have learned? What's the hierarchy that I am going to? And maybe it is the Reiki master, you know, and that's awesome. But, you know, there is a passing down of information in Reiki. So you would think of it as the Hierophant. So you would think of Asui as the Hierophant and everybody after him, you know, is passing down that spiritually taught information. So, um, so that's kind of what the Hierophant is. And, you know, one of the things about the Hierophant that is really important is you do not have to have the same relationship with the Hierophant as everyone else does. I had this reading with uh, Mary Beth Bonfiglio. This was a long time ago. And she pulled the Hierophant for me and she's like, oh, the Hierophant, you got the, the spiritual master. You are a spiritual master, you know. Like she saw this as pure channeling, a spirit coming straight through you so that you could write and write and write. And I was like, I love this interpretation. Like if I had saw it, I was like, oh yeah, you know, I wrestle with the rules. I'm a rule follower. That's part of my burden that I carry in this world is like I have a really struggle breaking the rules, even though I was a punk rocker kid, you know, um, I just don't do that. And uh, so it, it, it's a struggle, right? So at any rate, let's talk about the earth medicine. I have, it's almost an hour already. I cannot believe that. But let's talk about the earth medicine. So Angelica root is our herb of the month to work with. So Angelica is, or Angelica root, if I think you pronounce it that way. Um, it perf prefers northern latitudes, but it's pretty much distributed throughout the world. So Asia, Europe, US, I would say northern hemisphere. Um, and it's... It grows in damp soil near running water along woodland edges. Um, and helica roots are aromatic and considered to have uh, warming energy. So uh, angelica root can be used as teas. It can be tinctured. It can be used as flavorings in liqueur. And helica is the European cousin of Dong Quai. So it does help with um, hormonal changes it is a graceful flowering plant related to carrots or dill or fennel, and it's found uh, up in Lapland and then as far south as South Carolina. So if you can kind of imagine that on the globe. So the plant has a really intense and sweet aroma that's more like carrots than dill, okay? So you would kind of smell it that way. It's beautiful. Um, it has a lot of magical properties. It is thought to be a powerful guardian and healer. It is obviously named Angelica root because uh, it's actually Angelica Arc Angelica. That's the Latin name of it. Um, but it's called. It's used to call upon the angels. So it's 
used in angelic circles. And I definitely use the essential oil of angelica root, not just because it is my like patron name, <laughs> but um, because it's protective and works with angelic energy. It provides strength and power to women. And it's used by many people for the purpose of warding off evil and as luck and uh, health and in family and it protects children. So it's also used to attract positive energy and protect against negative energy. So it's used in hoodoo and witchcraft to draw blessings and to ward off hexes and curses. It's also used in spells and rituals to bring about prosperity, protection, and healing. Some have referred to it as the cure for all conceivable ailments, uh, but mostly it was used to prevent toxicity infections and, and stop the spread of plague during plague outbreaks. So it's used to pur purify blood. It typically blooms at the same time of day as um, Archangel Michael comes. And so it is said to kind of like bring, off, bring in the protective element of Michael. Um, so it was used to ward off evil. So that's why it started getting that association. Um, so it works with uh, defenses against curses, spells, and enchantments. Um, so from Cole Pepper's herbal almanac which was written in the 17th century it advises preparing a candy out of the roots and stalks um, and benedictine and chartreuse are two herbal liqueurs that contain angelica as one of their flavor components so angelica is revered in wicca and witchcraft um, for all the things we talked about um, again it bestows virtues of peace and emotional restraint and warding off evil and all of those things so um, it's used for a lot of different things, protective amulets and charms and warding off malevolent spirits. And um, it's even used like in exorcisms. Um, in hoodoo practice, it's used in love spells and it's used to attract positive relationships. So um, that's Angelica Root. And I'm excited to kind of work. I, I work with Angelica Root a lot. And I use it as... Um, like from the essential oil a lot for dressing things like my candles and things like that uh, for anointing my third eye and opening up um, when I'm working with angels. Um, so let's talk about the um, crystals and the stone medicine of the month. So black tourmaline is our first one, and this is a go-to for protection. It's wonderful when we move into winter into the north, which is a very grounding spot on the medicine wheel. This is just a go-to for protection. It's great for uh, protecting against EMF, like uh, electric, um, low frequency electromagnetic energy. So putting it in front of your computer, for, for example, it's a transmuter. So it is, it has piezoelectricity and basically it's a good one to transmute energy from negative to neutral. Okay. So a lot of people are like, it makes positive energy. No, it doesn't make neutral energy. It doesn't Energy is not, I, I, I hate when people are like, oh, they have really negative energy. You're perceiving their energy as negative. They just have their energy. You know, their energy is theirs. But black tourmaline is wonderful for protection. So we use it as energy workers. Um, it's good for teachers, therapists, social workers, customer service people, anybody who deals with lots of different kinds of people and energy. Black tourmaline is easy to find in jewelry. Um, wearing black tourmaline in a pendant or a necklace is very easy, and it's a very practical way to use it. There's no crystal I probably recommend more than black tourmaline, maybe clear quartz, but it is a grounding power, powerhouse. It's an energetic cleanser and purifier. Um, it's just wonderful. Even the most seasoned of practitioners forgets to ground and protect their energy field, especially when they're working on clients they know really well. So, you know, it's wonderful to just kind of wear a black tourmaline or keep it in your pocket or keep it in your bra if you wear a bra um, because it, it just will be there working. It's damned hardest. So black tourmaline resonates with the root chakra the, or the earth star chakra, which governs our connection to the earth. Um, and that's, you know, below our feet. It's not on the body, the earth star. So tourmaline is used as a grounding stone. Um, it's perfect for empaths, for intuitives, for psychics, and anybody engaged in healing work. It really counters stress, addictive behavior, anxiety. It's great for the workplace. Um, just overall, it's just a wonderful 
stone and I'm like looking in front of my computer and I have three giant black tourmalines here. So I do work with it a lot. Um, our next stone is sodalite. And so sodalite is a blue tectosilicate. So it is a silicate um, that has a Mohs hardness of 5.5 to 6. Most sodalite have white veins running through it. And a lot of people get sodalite and lapis confused. Lapis has flecks of pyrite in it. Sodalite usually doesn't. Um, that white veining running through it is calcite which gives it just a, not only a great color, but it, it's, you know, a wonderful guide for meditation. And sodalite is. Sodalite is a wonderful third eye or throat stone. So you can use it both places. It's said to be great for meditation, journeying, lucid dreaming, other dream work. So it not only opens the third eye, it helps you get into that trance state. So it's used as a tool. Um, it's a really great tool for astrologers, numerologists, uh, tarot card readers, uh, anybody who's working to identify archetypal patterns or symbolism, which is why it helps psychics more than mediums and channels, though it does do that too. It really is good for recognizing patterns, which is another bonus for psychic work. Satellite is kind of a stone of the be here now, so to speak, idea of like presence. So holding a satellite to be in the energy of now is really useful. Satellite is called the stone of writer. So it's used to write to kind of get that information out. So you can use it to uh, as an ally for writing. And, you know, of course, satellite's beautiful. It's like a, a deep blue with, with that white veining. Now, the other stone we pull, I pulled this month is blue kyanite, which is also a blue stone. Now, there's lots of different kyanites. You know, you have black, uh, orange. The blue has this very special vibration of the upper chakras, particularly the third eye. I, I can still remember the first time I put a blue kyanite on my third eye. It was an incredible experience. It is considered a bridge stone. That means it makes connections between different chakras. So putting it on the third eye helps you bridge the transpersonal chakras, the ones that are working with the Akashic Records and our past lives and all that stuff with the third eye. So it is a particularly uh, good stone to facilitate communication between you and your guides or you and your past lives or you and your future lives. It enhances telepathy and connection between other people. So it helps align the chakras and is particularly stimulating for the third eye. Um, so our last medicine is uh, the medicine of animal. And um, so this month we're working with buffalo, which is actually what most um, people in North America who work with the medicine wheel use in the north. Um, so when we kind of dive into the realm of buffalo, it's really like tapping into um, the medicine of North America, okay? Because it encompasses a spectrum of qualities, including manifestation and protection and earth wisdom, earth creativity, uh, feminine uh, knowledge, abundance is a big one. And the list just goes on and on. It really is um, a wonderful guide for all things, you know. Um, Buffalo is an interesting guide because buffalo's medicine has changed based on the history of buffalo in North America. So buffalo is, it comes in when you're starting a sacred journey or kind of ending a, a cycle and starting a new cycle. So it honors, you know, every aspect of life from the tiniest creature to the grandest. And so buffalo guides you in forming a connection with mother earth and father sky. It encourages you to play a role in being a steward of the earth. It, it, you are now part of the interconnectedness of all that is, including all that is on life. And that's really, if I could say one thing that kind of wraps up what I always want to pass on to the people that I work with is what we need to understand is we are an integral part of nature. Like not only are we seeing the squirrel or the buffalo and it becoming our medicine. Now we become the buffalo's medicine as well. 
And so when we're, when we're medicine for someone else, we hope to be good medicine, not bad medicine, right? So we need to be in sync with the earth. Uh, praying, meditating, focusing on peace for all beings is part of the medicine of buffalo. And so showing gratitude for the gifts life gives is really important. You don't need to force things. You take the path of least resistance when you're working with buffalo because buffalo infuses you with strength of character. Um, so it teaches us a really valuable lesson about prosperity. It's not about chasing more. It's about appreciating what you have and seeing the abundance in it. When buffalo was, you know, hunted by native peoples, they used every part of the buffalo, like ev literally every part. Even the hooves would be made into glue. So when you work with buffalo or buffalo comes in, gratitude becomes a daily language. You see the blessings in all facets of creation. So, you know, one thing that buffalo is connected to is the story of white buffalo woman, as told by the Lakota people. Um, and it really reinforces the idea that everything is interconnected and struggle isn't the path to abundance about being connected to spirit and seeing spirit in all things. So, you know, before a buffalo hunt, tribes offered prayers of gratitude to great spirit. And after the hunt, they performed ceremonies to honor the spirit of the buffalo. So, you know, when we work with buffalo, we work with abundance and gratitude. So buffalo with its massive head represents, you know, higher intelligence and bridging the earthly and the otherworldly. It reminds us of our responsibility and how our emotions are projected outward onto other people. And again, you know, when we look at the medicine of any animal, we're looking at how it lives on the earth. So it lives protectively in um, herds, right? The females form defensive circles around the calves and the males def encircle the females and they show mutual respect, communal family bonds. There's an unwavering commitment to protect and honor all life within their circle. They have these big humps, which signify our own stored energy within us. So buffalo's horns, anytime you have an animal with horns or antlers, they basically reach upward and signify the connection to spirit, okay, to higher wisdom. So it's a wonderful animal to work with both the blend of earthly grounding and spiritual connection. Um, so when we work with buffalo, if you're part of my membership group, we do a guided shamanic journey. We're going to be working with buffalo both in the lower world and the upper world. So this is going to be a really fun journey to both places. So um, thank you for being with me and hanging in there for this long ass uh, earth medicine reading. Um, I will see you in 2024. Thanks for listening to Centered with me, Angie Yinkst. If you'd like to send me a question or comment about this show or any shows, you can send them to angie at themoonandstone.com.